Right, a settlement today between J.P. Morgan Chase and the Securities and Exchange Commission. J.P. Morgan agreeing to pay more than $153 million to settle charges that it misled investors in a complex mortgage securities transaction in 2007, just as the housing market was starting to unravel. Sue Keenan here with me as well. She's been following the story uh, for us here on Bloomberg Television, and we're joined by Robert Kuzami. He is the Director of Enforcement at the SEC. He joins us from Washington. So, Robert, uh, why don't we start off, first of all, misleading clients always makes me think of Carl Levin and Goldman Sachs. What's the difference between the settlement that you guys did with Goldman and this and this nine figure settlement? Well, um, there's probably more similarities than differences. Um, it's the same general allegation of wrongdoing um, that in this case, J.P. Morgan uh, sold CDO investments to investors without revealing the fact that a hedge fund who was short that instrument helped to select the portfolio and that it had economic interests that were adverse to the investors because on balance they were hoping that the securities would fail. I've got a question though in terms of the size of the fine. Goldman paying a much bigger fine, the victims of that fraud if you will, sophisticated banks including German banks. In this case we had more small fry, uh, the Thrivent Financial for Lutherans, a faith-based uh, firm. Uh, can you tell us why the fine wasn't higher? Well, look, the fines and penalties in any given case are a function of a variety of factors. It's hard to look at two different cases uh, and compare because most of the time they're not apples and apples. The conduct may be differences. The investment size may be differences. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's particularly helpful. I think the message is in both cases that uh, if you engage in this kind of wrongdoing, if you mislead investors, you're going to pay a fine or a penalty that's a multiple, in some cases many times a multiple, uh, of the money that you thought you made in the deal. So it's best to steer clear of this kind of conduct. I got to ask, you know, there, there are a lot of big banks out there that were doing a lot of business during uh, the, the, the heart, really, the financial crisis. I can't believe Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan are the only two to have misled clients in this way, considering how many people work for all the big banks. Are you uh, looking at other banks right now in talks with other banks as well about this kind of settlement? Well, I would, uh, in the CDO space, I would also add um, Wachovia to that list because we charged Wachovia with selling CDO assets to retail investors um, that uh, didn't disclose uh, certain aspects of those transactions. We've also brought a lot of cases against mortgage issuers, such as Countrywide and New Century and IndyMac and mutual fund companies uh, who had uh, levels of mortgage exposure in their funds that they didn't disclose to investors such as State Street and Evergreen and Morgan Keegan and Schwab. So we're very active in the space. Uh, beyond that, I'll just tell you that what we've been saying all along is that cases arising out of the credit crisis are a high priority for the commission, and we continue to look closely at the sector. Um I've got a modern question in terms of investigation. How big a role the emails play? In a lot of these cases, particularly this one, we're seeing emails from uh, exuberant employees bragging about deals getting done before the whole thing falls apart. Of course, the sad part is that uh, the investors didn't know the deal was going to fall apart. How easier is it for you to get a settlement when you have this kind of evidence? Well, the email is a critical tool. Um, you know, it's not as good as a wiretap. Um, it's kind of a snapshot uh, wiretap, if you will, because at a particular point in time, you get the often uh, unvarnished uh, thoughts and views of individuals. So it's very valuable. On the other hand, you have to be careful. Um, you know, there's uh, more than one example historically of trying to uh, base a case solely on a small number of, of emails that turned out ultimately. Uh, not to convince a judge or a jury. So it's very important evidence, but you have to look at it in the totality of all of the evidence we gather in these cases from a whole variety of sources. You know, wiretaps have been obviously really helpful in prosecuting insider trading cases uh, of late. Can you use wiretaps? Uh, have you used wiretaps in dealing with this sort of thing? Well, I'm not going to talk about our investigative tools, but uh, as long as you meet the requirements uh, of the wiretap statute, uh, you can use them uh, for any kind of transaction uh, where there's probable cause of illegality and where the phones or other instrumentalities are being used to further that misconduct. So but if you I'm, meet the requirements, you can use them. I'm assuming these are, these are mostly after the fact uh, investigations here when we're talking about misleading clients in the financial crisis, right? You're looking back at these cases and trying to decide what happened. 
That's certainly correct. It has to be ongoing misconduct for you to be able to use a wiretap. There are other devices that, uh, that authorities can use, such as cooperating witnesses who may be uh, tape recording conversations that can talk about historical conduct. But you're right, wiretaps deal with ongoing misconduct. Robert, real quick, uh, the status of Magnetar, the hedge fund uh, that was involved here, is a probe ongoing there? Well, uh, I think the, the answer to that really is no, um, simply because the securities laws, as I'm sure you know, are premised on disclosure. And it was J.P. Morgan and GSC that had the disclosure obligations here in the pitch books and the term sheets and the offering materials that were given to investors. Magnetar did not have those obligations, and so um, uh, for that reason, they really don't face uh, liability uh, at this point. Got it. Hey, Robert, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate the time. Robert Kuzami, their enforcement director at the SEC.